Good morning, Life Spring. Welcome to our Christmas service. Merry Christmas. We're so excited to get to worship with you. Let's get up on our feet. Let's get ready to sing praise to the Lord. Amen. Just, um, just have communion amongst yourselves today. We're going to uh, sing a beautiful song, one that you know. Um, it's uh, Silent Night. And uh, whenever I think of this song, uh, I think of the history of this song, written in the, I think it was the 1700s, and then, but it, it spread around the world. I mean, they, it was written in Austria, and so the Germans knew it very well, and in World War I, in 1914, the English and the Americans and the Allies had trenched in on one side, the Germans had trenched in on another side, and there was what was called a no man's land. If you crossed over, you were probably shot. But on Christmas Eve of 1914, the Germans started singing this song, and they would sing it, Stille Nacht, Stille Nacht. Then the English and Americans recognized it on the other side, and they would sing, all is calm, all is bright. And together, for one moment in history, a world war was shut down and stopped, and there was peace on earth 
as the two sides that shot at each other came out and celebrated Christmas Eve together. Isn't that beautiful? The Christmas truce of 1914. And that's the power of God on the earth. And, uh, you know, God can stop wars. God can heal people. God can deliver people. God can set people free. God can do miracles. And this morning, as we celebrate this, as the, the band begins to sing this, just begin to think about Jesus, what he means to you, that he died on the cross for our sins and our salvation. And the bread, of course, represents his body that was crucified. And the cup represents his blood. And just take... Uh, communion amongst each other or with your families as we sing this beautiful song. God bless you this morning.
the ushers come to collect what's left of your communion, um, I just wanted to share right quick something that hit me this last week was um, when Jesus was born and when he came to the earth, um, he was born in a manger in a dirty place with animals and, you know, um, the second thing was that he, my mind just went blank. I knew this would happen, but he, <laughs> he, um, but also when he was born, the angels went and told the shepherds. They didn't go to the, the high priests or the kings or the majesties. Or, they just went to the shepherds, the blue collar workers, just like us right here in this building. And so um, I say that to say, let's let that encourage us that Jesus is here for us too. It's not just the high or the low, or it's, he's the average too. He's, he's here for everyone. He's come for all of us. Amen. And um, I think this holiday season, Christmas looks different for a lot of us with COVID restrictions and everything going on in the world. We may not get to see certain family members or um, maybe you couldn't afford a gift for your kids that you wanted to get so bad. But it brings me back and reminds me that Christmas is not about the gifts. Again, it's not about even our family, it's about Jesus, and it's about celebrating his birth, celebrating that he came into this world, that he came for us, you know, and um, what a blessing that is, and this next song is called The Blessing, and I thought it goes so perfect with Christmas because it reminds me of the blessing that Jesus is to us, and um, you know, Jesus was born as a virgin, that was the other thing that I forgot, I don't know how I could forget that, but um, he was born of a virgin, just how miraculous that is and, and how crazy that is. And when Jesus came into the world, times were crazy and it was unprecedented. You know, everything that, that he came into. And I just think it's going to have to get a little bit more crazy for him to come back, you know, for good. And so just to see everything going on in the world, see it as a blessing and see it as encouragement because our Savior is coming. And he's coming soon, and he's coming for us. Amen? So let's sing this song together. Let's declare it over our children, over our families. Father, we're so thankful. We thank you that you give us children to carry on um, your name and who you are and to bring honor and glory. Father, that's the whole purpose of family, Father. We thank you for that. We praise you for that, Father. We pray that as we worship you this morning, it would be in one voice and it would be in unity, Father God, that we would, we would bless your name this morning. We would magnify your name, Father. That's what we're here to do. That's what we were created to do. And that's what we want to do this morning. Oh 
talks about in the book of Exodus that a generational curse is goes for four generations but then in Deuteronomy 111 a generational blessing goes for a thousand generations and Amen. I got better news every curse was crucified on the cross of Jesus so if you've been told you have a generational curse you don't have to suffer from that generational curse Amen. and you can begin to establish generational yes. blessings in your family that'll go for a thousand generations. Hey, tell somebody that's great news. You may be seated in his presence today. Yes. Amen. Oh, thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this day. We celebrate this day, Lord Christmas. The, we, we celebrate it as the day you were born. Lord, we thank you that you came to this earth. And uh, God, we just uh, can't thank you enough. The greatest gift of all, giving your only son, Jesus. Lord, to, to be born on this earth, to do a fabulous ministry, to change the world, and then to give up his life as a ransom for many. We thank you for it. We praise you for it, and we thank you for the joy 
we can have in your name. We set aside all distractions and we experience the joy of the Holy Spirit right now. We receive it in Jesus' name. All right. If you notice this morning, we've got a few friends with us over here and a few more friends over here. So I'm going to talk about these today. Uh, Merry Christmas, everyone. Uh, I hope this uh, Thursday and Friday, Christmas Eve and Christmas, you'll have the best one ever. And that you take a minute to remember it's not about presents, it's not about lights, it's not about that red bearded fella that was generous, it's about Jesus Christ. Amen? Uh, so this morning, I want to kind of spin off of last week's series, and I've got a message called The Three Kings. And it may not be what you think, because there were three kings at Christmas, at the birth of Jesus. Which, by the way, we celebrate Christmas time uh, on December 25th, because it's convenient for our calendars. But there's probably evidence that Jesus was born in September. So, but it just didn't fit into our Roman calendar system. So somehow it got put on the 25th. But anyway, that's just an extra trivial fact. But when September rolls around, you can tell everybody Merry Christmas and they'll look at you weird. <laughs> so, but I want to talk about the three kings of Christmas. And um, if you'll notice over here is a very important scene going on. There's baby Jesus down here. There's Mary and Joseph and a shepherd. There were more shepherds, but they just didn't make them in this cast right here. And then over here... These are the three kings of the east, and we had a little accident with one of them here. He lost his hands earlier as my <laughs> little grandson got excited, knocked the table, and, but we'll, we'll fix him. Okay, don't worry about him. He's going to be okay. But the three kings of Christmas. So I want to share about that, and I want to talk about the first group of kings, and it's really a message on joy, and you'll see why. But the joyous kings, what they call the wise men from the east, now, these dudes right here, they traveled a thousand miles. They were from Persia, uh, and they were called the Magi, um, and we'll explain why in a minute. But they came a thousand miles, and they were not at the manger scene. I know that the Nativity has all these people around the manger scene, but these guys didn't arrive till about a year later, and Jesus was already a toddler. But we'll talk about it. The Bible says young child. So probably maybe Camden's age. I don't know. My grandson. I don't know. 18, 19 months. But uh, we know he was under two because of what Herod said. But let's look at the scripture. And I want to read to you and, and maybe give you some depth that maybe you've never seen perspective about Christmas before. Matthew 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is, these dudes over here, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Now, they came to Jerusalem because they, uh, we'll see in a minute, they followed a star, but they thought that since he's the king of the Jews and Jerusalem was the capital of Israel, that he, naturally he would be in the capital because they didn't have the Bible to tell them that they would be, he would be born in Bethlehem. But had they done a little more uh, research, they would have known. But they showed up. And they, they went before Herod, where is he, king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Now, scientists say that there is a Bethlehem star that um, comes every 2,000 years, and it's a bright uh, star that appears, and it appeared again, I think it was in 2015, somewhere on there. But uh, it, we'll see, we'll talk about this star uh, in a minute of what it actually was. What is it, an actual star or was it an angel? I'll let you decide, okay? When, he, when they heard the king, they departed and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them. Now let me ask you a question. If it was really a star, do stars went? No. Stars just have, you know, they're, they're fixed in the skies and they have a certain pattern and the earth revolves, but this star moved and went to a location. So that's clue number one. And then secondly, um, it, it, till it came and stood over where the young child was. The young child, not the babe. Where the young child was. So 
where, where, do stars, they don't go to a location and they don't stand over a house. But when you read the book of Revelation, especially chapter 5, you see that stars mean angels. So this was probably an angel that was guiding them to a location so they could meet Jesus. And so the star stood, uh, it went and it came and stood over where the young child was. And, and another translation says over the house, not the manger, but over the house. And uh, when they saw the star, watch this, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Now, I want you to catch this. How many could use some exceedingly? Exce not, not just joy. Not just great joy, but exceedingly. Means, we, we, Brittany came over to the house with Camden last night, and we watched some funny videos. You know, you can, you can find videos everywhere. And we watched these funny ones, people falling down, all kinds of bloopers and things like that. And we saw one that was so funny we were laughing so hard, and, and you know how you laugh so hard till you start coughing and stuff like that? You know, <laughs> you know and uh, you just run out of breath. We were laughing like that. We, we had exceedingly great joy over that video. Um, but these wise men had traveled a thousand miles because they saw this star, and these were kings. These were intelligent men. These were men who were not... Uh, the, the lower class, these were, these were kings. These men had treasures and things like that. Now, there was also the lower class because Jesus is not a God of the classes. Jesus doesn't reach out just to the down and out. He reaches up to the up and out. He reaches over to the up and out too. Or reaches down, I should say. He reaches down to the up and out. He reaches down to the down and out. And he reaches to everybody in between. He wants everyone. It's not based on class. It's not based on background. It's not based on ethnicity. It's not based on culture. It's just based on souls. And when you look into a soul, there's no black, white, Jew, Gentile, high class, low class. It's just people. Amen. God is all about people. So they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Then the scripture, the next scripture says this. When they had come, this is Matthew uh, 9 now, uh, 2, 9. When they had come into the house, see the house now, they saw the young child, the toddler, with Mary, his mother, and fell down. Now, that's two words in English, fell down. It's one word in the Greek, and it literally means violently. It literally means like if you take a vase and smash it into pieces. When they saw Jesus, they fell down violently, and they worshipped him. Amy, I see a lot of people fanning. Can you turn the air down a little bit or the heat off a little bit? Um, and when they opened their, watch this, treasures. You see, we do this nativity scene, and this guy's got one little thing, and this, when his hands are good, he's got one little thing on his hand, and he's got one little. But I want you to understand, these men that traveled from Persia had probably anywhere from six to ten servants with them, and ten or so camels with them, and they were loaded with treasures. And one of the purpose of the servants was to be bodyguards because along the travels along the road, there would be robbers jump out and trap. But when they see an entourage of this many men, they, they stayed away. They didn't attack them because there's some big bad dude bodyguard servants that are out there ready, prepared to fight. And so they protected their treasures. But it says they opened up their treasures. They fell down and worshipped him, and they opened up their treasures. They presented gifts to him, gold frankincense and myrrh gold stands for the royalty of christ frankincense stands for the divinity of christ and myrrh stands for the humanity of christ all these things had symbolic reasons behind it and then it goes on to say then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to herod they departed for their own country another way because if you remember, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, in the meantime, Herod found out about Jesus being called the king of the Jews and, the, and what they said and everything, king of kings, and he got jealous. And so he issued a decree in all of Jerusalem, all in all of Bethlehem, all babies two and under were to be killed. And we'll talk about that in a second. But so these guys, 
an angel appeared to them in a dream and God spoke to them. Now let me show you a couple things in this passage we just read. Number one, and you can, you can go back to, to the, that slide, yeah, the joy was in the journey. The joy that they had was set before them was in the journey to get to Christ. And then they had exceedingly great joy when they met Christ. I remember when the Dallas Stars hit a winning goal and, um, and they were headed to the Stanley Cup. For a moment, I had exceedingly great joy because I'm a, a, a big Dallas Stars fan. When there was a sale, 50% off at, 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 at uh, Amy's favorite department store, she had exceedingly great joy <laughs> for a moment. And so these guys, when they got in the presence of Jesus, even though he was a toddler, they recognized he was the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, and they did two things, which is on this next slide, two things. They worshipped, they fell down violently and worshipped, and they gave of their treasures. Now here's why a lot of people don't experience joy in life. Because they don't know how to worship exuberantly and they don't know how to give extravagantly. If you've never worshipped exuberantly because of the way you were brought up, or you just have pride, or you have some kind of block, and you, it's just not me, I don't worship exuberantly, you're missing out on joy, because in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. And I'm here to tell you, when we get excited about Jesus, like I was excited about that game-winning goal to send the stars to the Stanley Cup, that was an exciting moment. I lifted my hands. I may have even shouted. And why is it that we can do that at a game, but we can't do that in church? Oh, but we can. We can. In fact, I would like for you to look at your neighbor and say, for God's sake, would you get excited in here? Because, and I mean for God's sake, God loves people who give them his all. And he loves when you get past pride and go, I'm going to show everybody I love my king. I'm going to show everybody I love my... I don't care what anyone thinks about me. I'm, you know, I know uh, a lot of pastors, and I've been to their services and churches, and I've seen pastors, you know, sit on the front row and, you know, have a notepad and look around the whole time when worship is going on to see who's missing church, and they write down names so they know who to call. That's not good. I've seen pastors who are back studying in the green room while worship is going on because they want their message to be just right. If you'll notice something, I don't even have notes up here because I want the Holy Spirit to speak just what's right today. But the, the, the point is, is that when it's worship time, we need to be worshiping Jesus, not worried about who's here, who's not here, not uh, focused on the message. We just need to be focused on Jesus and worship and give him all. Right? Amen. So I challenge you, if you've never done that before, step out of your comfort zone, man. Step out of your shell. Get your hands in the air like you just don't care. Clap to the Lord. Give him a shout. All that. Do everything and worship him with some exuberance. These guys did. These guys were the successful men of the day, and they, they shattered themselves literally before the Lord because they were so excited. They were kings, but they had joy in the presence of the king of kings. And then the second part is the Bible says they opened up their treasures. Why is that so significant? And why do some people not have joy? Because we can be selfish and we're so thinking that the treasures are for us, for our retirement, for our family, for our education fund, for this and for that. And those things are good. But guess what? The Lord, he owns the earth and the fullness thereof, and we're just managers of his treasures. In fact, while I'm thinking about it, we're taking up a benevolence offering this month. And so we're challenging people to put in the budgets or online or mail it in 
a little extra so that people next year that are in need, and believe me, there'll be many of them. Jesus said there'll always be the poor. There'll be many people in need. And this month, all the extra offerings that you designate towards benevolence go to help out the needy. It's fantastic what we did this month. But in January, there's going to be hurting people and needing people too. So feel free to do that. So if you want to experience joy, these guys showed us that the way the joyous kings was in their journey, and when they got there, they worshipped exuberantly, and they gave extravagantly. So let's look at the next king that was around at that time, which was Herod, the jealous king. Now I want to tell you a little bit about Herod, but I'll read the scripture first, and then I'll tell you a little bit about it. So let's look at what the Bible says about in Matthew about Herod. Then Herod, remember the wise men, the kings had come and asked about the king of kings. When he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what was the time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child. You know, nine times in this passage that's mentioned the young child, not the babe. There's another that I'm going to talk about the babe in a minute, but the young child, the toddler. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Now, that was a dead lie. He wasn't wanting to worship him. He was the jealous king. He was wanting to kill him. Because look at what the scripture says. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry because the wise men said, okay, whatever, Herod. And then they had a, they had, they been, they been in the presence of the king, the king of kings, with exceedingly great joy and, and extravagant giving. And then they left because an angel appeared to them that night and says, you guys need to leave and go because Herod's not wanting to do some good things. So don't go back to Herod. So they did. They obeyed the Lord. And he was exceedingly angry. He sent forth and put to death all male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. He was so jealous that he wanted all, just, just in case Jesus the toddler was somewhere around Bethlehem, he, he said, okay, everybody two years and under, execute them. And we see movies about this and we see hundreds and thousands, but actually... According to, biblical, uh, according to record, historical records, there was about 24 babies that were killed. And that's horrendous. That's horrible. But the King of Kings wasn't killed. Jesus Christ wasn't killed. Because we know, as we'll see in a, a later text, that he told Jesus, he told Joseph in a dream, take your family down to Egypt because there's a jealous king. Now, I want to point out some things and contrast the joyous king from the jealous king. One is, Herod had a controlling spirit. There were, by the way, six Herods in the Bible. And this one lived right up until uh, Christ was born and then uh, 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 a little bit afterwards. When he made this decree to say all babies two and under in Bethlehem are killed, five days later... He died. Now, in the time when he said kill all the babies, he also killed his own son. Because word was already spreading around uh, Israel that Herod was called Herod the Great, which you know who named him that? Himself. Herod the Great told everybody, I'm no longer Herod, I'm Herod the Great. He had a controlling spirit. Controlling spirits will kill joy. Controlling, wanting to be in control all the time about everything will kill joy. The key to having joy is letting go. I can't express it enough. You let go in your worship, you let go in your giving, and you experience joy. I think it's really cool that uh, a week ago when I challenged everybody with the benevolence offering, and my, my daughter, I, I told you guys that I look for reasons to bless my children. 
when they're really obedient and when they go above and beyond, I look for excuses just to bless them. And, and last week, we, they came over. Uh, well, Brennan lives there, so he was already there. But, they, but only for a few more days. He's getting married next year, and uh, I don't know how big of a wedding they'll be able to have. Maddie's sitting right here. I, I'm so proud of our, our beautiful daughter that's coming into our family right here, Maddie. She's, she's over helping him with children and students and everything. They did a fantastic job. But they both came over to the house, and they both, uh, I, I was smoking meat and grilling meat, and I was just kind of tired. And so I said, I'm, I, you know, normally I do the cooking and the cleaning the dishes and everything, but I'm just going to sit back and just, you know. <laughs> Y'all can all relate, right? You, 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 you do a meal, and, and you get just so tired. Amy had already decided to sit back, apparently. Um, and so the kids though the kids saw a need and they stepped up and so I said you know what I'm so proud of y'all I'm going to give y'all each a hundred dollars and so Brittany she told me last week she goes you know what I did dad I was challenged with the benevolence I put it in the I, I passed on my blessing into the benevolence fund well the next day she goes to the grocery store and she gets in line you know she's big and pregnant just like, kind of looked like this. <laughs> and a lady happens to be standing behind her. And this lady works at an OBGYN office. So she begins to strike up a conversation with Brittany. And she said, can I buy your groceries for you? And Brittany said, sure. See, you can never, ever outgive God. He's going to bless you back every time. Amen. So... And that's what these, but a controlling spirit says, no, I have to control everything. I cannot give of my finances because I have to control. I have to save, 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 save. I have to put back, put back. And there's nothing wrong with that. But she just decided, you know what? I got blessed with something extra. I'm going to pass on the blessing. I spoke a message a while back. You can either pass on the blessing or you can pass on the blessing. And when we have a controlling spirit in our life and we get selfish, sometimes we pass on the blessing. And God says, okay, I'll bless someone else. Are you with me still? You still love me? I'm just preaching the word here. And the second thing about jealousy, about the jealous king Herod the Great is, and I, I love to say this, and this is another example. I taught this about Cain and Abel. And it's all through the Bible, a principle in the Bible. But unfulfilled expectations lead to offenses. Offenses lead to anger. Anger leads to hatred, and hatred leads to murder. And the whole pathway right here is illustrated in the story of Herod. He had an expectation to see these kings and to visit with these kings and, and to, to, to gain favor with these kings. Instead... He got offended when he heard, hey, where's the king of the Jews? We've come to worship him. And then he started stewing on that. It led to anger and hatred, and then it led to a decree, kill all the babies in Bethlehem. And unfortunately, because of one man's jealous, controlling spirit, many babies died that didn't have to die. Not only was Herod so uh, angry at, at that and so jealous he killed one night, he was having dinner, and his servants were whispering off to the side, and he, they were whispering about the dinner, hoping it was good enough for the king, Herod the Great. And they were whispering, and Herod thought they were whispering about him, and he ordered them dead. So they got killed. Herod the Great, he had three wives, and all of his wives were either murdered by him or exiled by him. Should have gone to marriage counseling. No, just kidding. Even that wouldn't help. You know, you know what I've learned? You can't counsel a demon. Some people just need to be set free. And a controlling spirit has to, has to get set free. The joyous king, the jealous king, and now the just king. The baby that was born. The king of all kings. The lord of all lords. Let's look at this scripture here. And as I, as I read this scripture, I want you to think about something. In 1906, there uh, was, uh, all they had over the airwaves was Morse code. And it was, 
They have these guys on ships with earphones on and they would understand and interpret Morse code and they would send messages back and forth over the airwaves. Well, they had come along in, in radio transmissions and they had invented a way where they could speak over the air. And so the first words were uttered on Christmas Eve 1906 and this is what they said. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields. They began to read the Christmas story over the airwaves and I want you to think about that because the devil is called the prince of the power of the air and there's no doubt in my mind that the devil owns the media, the devil owns the airway, the devil is the prince, he, God has given him control over the airwaves and that's why we see so many lies over the airwaves, so much filth and pornography and everything else over the airwaves because the devil is in control of all of it and so it must have burned him up when the prince of the power of the air heard the very first words uttered over the airwaves on Christmas Eve of 1906. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. Now, it's cool what, the way that's worded. This will be a sign to you. How do you know where? Well, go to, your, go to a feeding trough. You know, the, the Greek word for manger is not like we think like a barn. The Greek word is actually a feeding trough. And the word for, for swaddling cloth, that sounds so good, doesn't it? Like so comfortable and cozy, a swaddling cloth. But it was literally strips of cloth. And you may say, why would, why would there be strips of cloth? Why would Mary carry around strips of cloth? Because in those days, under Jewish law, Jewish people were not allowed to touch a dead body. And many times, they would be on the road in their travels, and someone had gotten robbed and beaten up, or someone had gotten killed and just thrown on the roadside. And so the Jews would take these strips of cloth and cover them so they didn't touch the body, and then lift up the cloth and take them and bury them properly. That was one reason. The other reason is because many women that got pregnant in that day, they didn't have the medical um, technology that we have today, and many women during childbirth would... Either the baby would die and they would wrap them up with the burial cloth and bury them properly or the mother would die and the husband would wrap them up and bury them properly. So that's why Mary had these strips of cloth when she gave birth to Jesus Christ. And, and, I, and I want you to imagine this. I want you to think about this because where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. Bethlehem was where Jesus was born. In fact, you can go to Israel today. You can go to Bethlehem if you're willing to cross over in the West Bank, which is controlled by the Muslims now. But you can go over there and you can see where Jesus Christ was born, the exact location where Jesus Christ was born. And it, it just sounds better to say a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger rather than a babe, you'll be in burial cloths wrapped in a feeding, in a feeding trough, right? That sounds a lot better, doesn't it, than, than, than that. But that's the original Greek translates to that. And so here's the cool thought. In Bethlehem, just a few, just a, a few yards away is Rachel's tomb, where Rachel gave birth to Benjamin. And if you don't know that story, Rachel had given birth to Joseph. There was a whole rivalry because uh, Jacob had two wives, and uh, Leah and Rachel, if you remember, and there was kind of a competition to have babies. Well, Leah started sprouting out babies like crazy. Rachel couldn't have one. She was barren for a while. She finally had Joseph, and then she had Benjamin in Bethlehem. When she had Benjamin, 
She had a great travail in childbirth and great suffering. And so she named the child Ben-Oni, which means child of my suffering. And then she died under a tree, very close to where Jesus was born. And Jacob saw that when the child was born and Rachel died, he said, no, this child is not going to be named Ben-Oni, child of my suffering. This child is going to be named Benjamin, child of my right hand. In the same city, a few thousand years later, Jesus Christ, who if you think about it, could have been born in a palace, could have been born anywhere, but he was born in a feeding trough, wrapped in burial cloths, which is so appropriate because he was born to die for our sins. And the Ben Oni was changed to Benjamin thousands of years before the, that the child of suffering now was the child of my right hand, which symbolically was foreshadowing Jesus' birth because Jesus was born and he endured suffering of the cross for the joy that was set before him so he could sit on the Father's right hand. Isn't that cool? The Bible is the most complete perfect story uh, and principles in the Bible ever. But you know what Jesus chose to do? He gave up all control. He chose to be born as an infant. You think about that. How much time, how much dependency does a baby have on their mother and their father? They have to be fed. They have to be nurtured. They have to be taught. They have to be the whole thing. He chose to give up control so that he could have the joy that was set before him because he loved you so much. Now I ask you a question at Christmas. Are you going to be like the joyous kings and give up control and say, I'm going to worship Jesus exuberantly? And not just at Christmas, but I hope for the rest of your life. I'm going to worship Jesus exuberantly. I'm going to give extravagantly. Or are you going to be like the jealous king that says, nope, it's mine, mine, my time, my pride, my stubbornness, my, my everything. I'm not giving up anything. Because all Jesus wants is your heart. And he gave up everything to be born a baby and to be raised by earthly parents. He gave up all control to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's the Christmas story you may have never heard before. But that's the true Christmas story. As we bow our heads and close our eyes, I just want to ask you to check into your heart and ask yourself a question. Do I have the joy of the Lord? Because if I have the joy of the Lord, it can be my strength that when I go through hard times, when I go through bad times, when I go through poor circumstances, I can endure through those things because I focus on the joy that is set before me, my relationship with Jesus Christ. And I can't wait till the next time I get to worship Christ exuberantly and worship Christ joyously and give extravagantly. Or am I more like Herod that says, my way, I want to control things. I'm asking you this morning to give up control like Jesus did, who became, the Bible says, lower than a servant, lower than a slave. The Bible says in Philippians 2, he gave up everything, all control. This morning, if God is speaking to you, just slip your hand up and say, man, that's me. I'm giving up all control. I want God to change my life. Yes, 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 yes. Say, I want God to change my life. Father, I thank you for all the hands that were raised. I thank you for the Christmas story. And I thank you for the principles. And God, we want to be like the joyous kings. We want to worship you with all our heart, all our might, all our strength. We want to worship you even with our finances. This morning, Lord, we make a commitment 
to do that before you because we want the joy of the Lord. And Lord, we thank you that you gave up all control. In fact, right now, God, we just rebuke a controlling spirit in our lives. We rebuke it and we do not participate with it. And we cast it out in Jesus' name. Controlling spirit must bow down and leave this house. Leave these people in Jesus' name. I realize that I am not in control. Father, you control my life. You control my finances. You control my my time. You control everything about me. And I'll be a good steward of all that. And I give it back to you, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Now as they dim the light, the band is going to sing this song again. And if you have one of these candles, just twist it, tighten it, and it'll come on and flicker. And just hold it up. And as we sing this together, just kind of wave it back and forth. As a, as a sign, you're saying, God, I give up control to you. Lord, I want you to be the joy. I want to have the joy in my heart. Lord, I want to worship you and praise you and live for you every moment of my life. So let's just sing this together as we do this as the band leads us in. stand together to sing this last verse. I just want to pray a prayer of blessing over you as we go, as we uh, spend this wonderful week with our friends and our family. We just want to pray a prayer of blessing that it's going to be an amazing week and we don't forget to celebrate Jesus on this Christmas day. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for another wonderful Christmas service, Lord God. We thank you that you were lifted up here today in Jesus' name, that you are the one, the reason for the season, that you are the one who who blessed us, who, who forgave us for our for 
our sins, Lord. We thank you that you have come to earth for us, Lord God. We thank you. Lord, we pray a blessing over everyone this week, Lord. We pray a, a prayer of, of uh, protection over them, Lord, that the virus will not, will not, and, and cannot come to any one of us here today, this week, as, a, as we come together with families and friends, Lord God, that we pray healing and, and, and protection over everyone in Jesus' name, Lord. We pray that you would just uh, show up in a mighty way in the homes of everyone here, Lord God. I pray that you would, ju you would be celebrated on not just Christmas Day, but every day, Lord God. We thank you. Lord, we praise you and we give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if, if you do want to take pictures, Santa's going to be in the back. We're going to do a couple of pictures with families and stuff. Y'all can stay and hang out and please come be a part. God bless you. See you next week.